welcome back to my channel. And if you are visiting this space for the first time, you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the gluteal region. Using this image by the side, this is where we have the gluteal region here arrowed at this point. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the functions and also highlighting the different structural components of this region. The gluteal region is located at the posterior pelvic region and can also be referred to as the buttock area or the glutes. We try to use this image by the side. This is where we have the configuration of the gluteal region. Within this space, we have a number of structures. These structures would be unfolding as we go through with this lecture. Let's try and highlight the boundaries of the gluteal region. This gluteal region is seen to extend superiorly from the iliac crest. And this is what is arrowed here at this point. The iliac crest is the superior edge of the ilium. And we know that the ilium is one of the structural components of the hip bone. The ilium is located at the superior lateral region of the hip bone. And its superior head here, that is referred to as the iliac crest, is seen to mark the superior limit of the gluteal region. Inferiorly, it is limited by the gluteal fold. And this is what is arrowed here in yellow. So you see that at the upper edge it is limited by the iliac crest, while inferiorly it is limited by the gluteal fold. On the lateral side, there is an imaginary line that is highlighted here in dotted black. And this imaginary line is seen to run superiorly from the anterior superior iliac spine to the greater truncata at this inferior hinge. So this imaginary line is seen to mark the lateral limit of the gluteal region. Why medial it is seen to be limited by the intergluteal cleft, which can also be referred to as the natal cleft. So you see that we have the superior, inferior, the medial, also the lateral boundaries highlighted here in this slide. If you try to use this lower image, this is where we have the gluteal region here captured at this point. And we say that superiorly it is limited by the iliac crest. Inferiorly, we have the gluteal fold that is arrowed here in yellow. On the lateral side, we have an imaginary line that is drawn from the anterior superior iliac spine to the greater truncata. And this imaginary line is seen to limit the gluteal region on its lateral side. And if you go more medially, you have the intergluteal cleft that marks the medial limit of the gluteal region. So as you have this presentation on this side, you also have it created on the other side. So let's drive further using this slide to highlight the different functions of the gluteal region. The gluteal region is seen to head movement, running, and also standing postures. We know that the gluteal region is structurally made up of a number of structures. And these structures, we have muscles forming the greater proportion of each structural component. These muscles are seen to be inserted on the upper region of the lower limb. And because of this, it is seen to head movement, running, and also sitting posture because these muscles are able to control these actions through their point of insertions. It's also seen to contribute or support sitting posture. We know that during the process of sitting, the impact is created more on the gluteal region. So it is seen to help support the sitting posture. It also creates pathway for muscles and neurovascular structures. By the time we'll be highlighting the different structural components of the gluteal region, you see that we have a number of muscles and also neurovascular structures parting through the gluteal region. These structures are not seen to be positioned within the space, but they only take this space as a pathway in getting to their point of destinations. So as we go through with this lecture, we would be highlighting this interesting part through which some muscles and also neurovascular structures run within the gluteal region, where it is created like a pathway for these structures. So let's highlight the structural component of the gluteal region. The structural components of the gluteal region include the bone. This bone forms like a background or the basis onto which the other structures are lined upon. So we have a number of bones contributing to the bony landmark of the gluteal region. We try to use this image by the side. This is where we have the ilium. We already established that the ilium is located at the superior lateral region of the bony pelvis. And at this region specifically, it is the posterior surface that is seen to contribute to the alignment of the gluteal region. 
And the inferior region here, we have the ischium that is harrowed here at this point. This ischium is also positioned at the posterior region of the bony pelvis. And this is where it is also seen to form the posterior landmark of the gluteal region. We have the pobex. The pobex is not contained or seen around the posterior region of the bony pelvis. If you try to view my lecture on the bony pelvis, in that lecture, we highlighted that the pubic is located in the anterior region of the bony pelvis. And if it is located around the anterior region, it means that the pubic will not be seen to contribute to the bony landmark of the gluteal region because the gluteal region is located at the posterior pelvic region. So we have just two bones, which include the ilium and also the ischium contributing to the bony landmark of the gluteal region. Why the pubic is located in the anterior part and it is not seen to contribute to the formation of the bony landmark of the gluteal region. Also to add that the ilium and the ischium that are located at the posterior region of the bony pelvis and are also seen to contribute to the bony alignment of the gluteal region are also seen to present some form of transformations. And this includes the formation of the notches. We have notches which are indentations created around the ilium and also the ischium. We'll be driving more on this as we go through with this lecture. These notches are further transformed into foramina. And we'll be highlighting how these notches are, of course, transformed into foramina at this posterior end. This is an interesting presentation that we need to highlight during the course of study. We also have ligaments. Ligaments are also seen to contribute to the structural component of the gluteal region. The ligaments are seen to anchor the different bones at joints. We know that the bone in pelvic is made up of a number of bones, and these bones are also seen to connect together at joints. At the point where these joints are created, we have ligaments reinforcing this joint in a way of supporting and structurally protecting this joint. So we have a number of ligaments around the posterior region of the bony pelvis. And this is where we have the posterior sacroiliac ligament. This posterior sacroiliac ligament is seen to be highlighted here in yellow and it's seen to reinforce the sacroiliac joint. Remember that we say that this ligament are seen to reinforce joint. We also have the posterior sacrococcygeal ligament. And this is what is also seen to be highlighted here in yellow. The posterior Sacrococcygeal ligament is also seen to anchor or support the sacrococcygeal joint at this posterior region. And we'll be dwelling more on this as we go through with this lecture. The other structural components include muscle. We also have a number of muscles. As a matter of fact, the muscular component of the gluteal region is seen to take up a higher proportion of its structural component. These muscles are further subdivided into two subunits. We have the deep layer of muscles, and this is what is elected here in blue. This deep layer of muscles are seen to be deeply embedded within the gluteal region. And this is, of course, overlined by the superficial layer of muscles. And this is what is elected here in yellow. So you see that these muscles are in two subsets. We have the deep layers and we have the superficial layers. We'll also be dwelling more on this as we go through with this lecture. We also have a number of vessels and also nerves. And this is what is elected here in this image. So these structures are seen to be positioned within the gluteal region. We are going to be taking each of these structural components one after the other, and we'll be explaining how they run and finally being positioned within the gluteal region. So first, let's look at the bony landmark of the gluteal region. Of course, we already said in our previous slide that the bony landmark is what creates the background onto which the other structures are lined upon. So we have the posterior surfaces of the ilium and also the ischium. Remember, we already highlighted that the pubic is located at the anterior region. So it is not seen to contribute to the bony alignment of the gluteal region. So we have the posterior surface of the ilium, and this is what is harried here in purple. And we also have the posterior surface of the ischium. This is what is also seen to be harried here in purple. So these two bones are seen to form the bony alignment of the gluteal region. And the posterior surfaces of these bones are seen to contribute to this formation. We already highlighted a bit on this in our previous slide. It is also important for us to highlight some landmarks around the ilium and also the ischia. Remember, we highlighted that the posterior pelvic, specifically the ilium and the ischium, form the background 
of the posterior glutea region. And this is understandable. So driving deep into some distinct features that are important for us to highlight. Around the ilium, there is an indentation that is created, and this indentation is referred to as the greater sciatic notch. This is where we have the greater sciatic notch highlighted in black. This greater sciatic notch is an indentation that is created on the ilium, and this notch is further transformed into a foramen. And this is why it is important for us to highlight this notch. This foramen is created, and this allows for the passage of some structures. So this is where we have the greater sciatic notch here, an indentation that is created around the ilium, which is further transformed into the greater sciatic foramen, which is a corresponding name foramen by a ligament. We'll be highlighting the ligament that is responsible for this transformation. As we get to the point where we'll be highlighting the ligament component of the gluteal region. But just for us to know at this point that we have an indentation that is created on the ilium, and this is what is highlighted here in this image. And this is further transformed into a foramen by a ligament. And this is what is carried here in green. Another important landmark that we should highlight is the lesser sciatic notch. We also have another notch that is created. And this is what is highlighted here also in dotted black. This lesser sciatic notch is also an indentation that is created on the ischial. So this lesser sciatic notch is lesser because it is located inferior to the greater sciatic notch. And it is created at this point. This lesser sciatic notch is also further transformed into a foramen. So it is transformed into its corresponding named foramen, which is the lesser sciatic foramen. And this is also done by a ligament. It says that we would be highlighting the ligament that is responsible for this transformation as we go through with this lecture. But it is important for us to highlight this landmark has specific regions of the ilium and also the ischial. So this structure that is harrowed here in yellow is the lesser sciatic notch. And then the last structure that forms the structural component of the background of the posterior glottal region. So are the posterior surfaces of the sacrum and also the cortex. This is where we have the sacrum here at this upper edge. And we know that at the inferior region of the sacrum, we have the cortex. And this is what is also harrowed here in red. So these are the structures that will come together to create a background onto which muscles, ligaments, and also neurovascular structures will be lied upon. So this is like the background of the posterior pelvic region, which is the gluteal region. So now let's go through the ligament. This is another structural component of the posterior gluteal region. In our previous slide, we highlighted the structures that form the background of the posterior pelvic region, which is the gluteal region. So for the ligaments, the ligaments basically are seen to reinforce the joints of the pelvic cavity, and they are also seen to form foramen. Remember we described in our previous slide that we have notches created. These notches, we say that they are further transformed into foramina, and we say that this transformation is done by ligaments. So we have some groups of ligaments that are responsible for transforming these notches into foramina. And we have another set that are designed for reinforcing the joint around the pelvic region. We know that the pelvic cavity is made up of different types of bones that come together at points. I remember in our previous slide, we already created a background. We have the ilium at this upper head, and at this inferior head, we have the ischial. We say that the pubic is located in the anterior region. So it is not seen to form the structural background of the posterior pelvic region, which is the glottal region. So these two bones, are seen at this posterior region, and these are the two bones that are seen to form the background of the gluteal region. We also highlighted an indentation here at this upper edge that is referred to as the greater sciatic notch. Then we have an indentation also created at this lower edge that is referred to as the lesser sciatic notch. We say that the greater sciatic notch is an indentation. That is why it is so referred to as a notch, and it is specifically located around the helium. Then we have the lesser sciatic notch that is located around the ischium. We say that the ilium and the ischium are the two bones that you see around the posterior pelvic region. And these are the bones that, of course, will be forming the background of the gluteal space. So let's now drive in into the different ligaments that are seen around the posterior pelvic region. The first ligament that would be highlighting is the sacrospinous ligament. The sacrospinous ligament is what is seen here to be highlighted in green. As I've always said on this channel, it's for us to always break down the name. 
sacrospinous. It is a ligament that runs from the sacrum to the spinous process of the ischium. This is where we have the spinous process of the ischium at this end. And at this upper end, you have the sacrum. So you see this ligament running to and fro these two points. And as a result of this pattern of movement, it is seen to be transforming this greater sciatic nerve into the greater sciatic foramen. So this is where we have the sacrospinous ligament harrowed in green. And as a result of the path by which the sacrospinous ligament runs, it is seen to be transforming this greater sciatic nerve into the greater sciatic foramen. So you have a foramen created at this region as a result of the pattern by which the sacrospinous ligament runs to and fro the sacrum, so the spinous process of the ischium. And this is what is created around this point. And this foramen is created to allow for the passage of structures. So you have a number of structures passing through this foramen as it is created at this region. So this is one of the ligaments that we see that helps to transform a notch into a foramen. The second ligament is the sacrotuberous ligament. We also need to break down the name. This is where we have the sacrotuberous ligament here highlighted in yellow. And this ligament will be seen to run from the tuberosity of the ischium. This is where we have the tuberosity of the ischium here, arrowed in black, to the sacrum that is arrowed here at this upper end. So you see it's also running to and fro these two sub-regions. And due to this alignment, it is seen to be transforming this lesser sciatic notch into the lesser sciatic foramen. So you have the creation of another foramen at this inferior end, and this is referred to as the lesser sciatic foramen, just a corresponding name foramen with the notch. So you can see how these two ligaments are helping to transform the notches into foramina. Also driving at other ligaments that are seen to help reinforce the joint of the pelvic cavity. Around this posterior region, we have the posterior sacroiliac ligament. This is where we have the posterior sacroiliac ligament here highlighted in purple. All we still need to do is to break down the name. We know that this ligament will be reinforcing the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is formed between the sacrum and also the ilium. This is where we have the sacrum here at this posterior edge, and this is where we have the ilium here at this lateral region. So this ligament is seen to reinforce this joint at this posterior region. And this is why it's so referred to as the posterior sacroiliac ligament. Because we have a posterior sacroiliac ligament, it means there's going to be an anterior sacroiliac ligament. That means another set of ligaments will be seen at the anterior region of the sacroiliac joint. But we'll not be highlighting this because our focus for this lecture is the posterior pelvic region, which is the gluteal region. So at this posterior head, the ligament that you would see around this posterior region is the posterior sacroiliac ligament. And this is what is harrowed here in purple. Another ligament that we have is the posterior sacrococcygeal ligament. This is the posterior sacrococcygeal ligament here that is highlighted here in red. All we still need to do is to break down the name. Posterior sacrococcygeal ligament is the ligament that reinforces the sacrococcygeal joint at the posterior region. This is where we have the sacrum and this is where we have the cusses. The point that exists between the sacrum and the cusses is the sacrococcygeal ligament. And at this posterior region, you also have another ligament reinforcing this joint. And this is the posterior sacrococcygeal ligament. As we have the posterior sacrococcygeal ligament, we would definitely be having an anterior sacrococcygeal ligament and the anterior head. But because our focus is on the gluteal region, we would be focusing just on the posterior sacrococcygeal ligament. And this is what is harrowed here in red. So these are the ligaments that you have helping to reinforce the joints created around the gluteal region and also helping to transform the notches into foramina. So now let's drive through the muscular components of the posterior gluteal region. First, before we drive in into this, we would be dividing the muscles that are located in the posterior gluteal region into two subunits. So we have the deep layer of muscle, and these are five in number. This deep layer of muscles are responsible for lateral rotation of the lower limb. These are deeply embedded within the gluteal region. And Overlying this deep layer of muscle, we have the superficial layer of muscle. This superficial layer of muscles are four in number, and they are responsible for the abduction and also extension 
of the lower limb. So you see that we have tried to group these muscles into two subunits where we have the deep layer and the superficial layer. We would be taking each of these subcomponents one after the other and highlighting the different muscles that are classified within each. First, let's drive through the deep layer of the gluteal muscle. We already described that the gluteal muscles are divided into two layers. We have the deep and also the superficial layers. The deep layer, we already said that it is embedded deep within the gluteal region, and it is made up of five muscles. This deep layer of muscles are responsible for lateral rotation of the lower limb. So the first muscle that we'll be looking at within the deep layer of muscles is the piriformis. This is the piriformis here, harrowed in yellow in this image by the side. This piriformis is the most superiorly placed muscle out of the deep layer of muscles located within the gluteal region. This piriformis is seen to originate from the anterior lateral surface of the sacrum. And this is what is harrowed here in yellow. This is where we have the sacrum here, and this is the posterior view of the sacrum. The fibers of the piriformis are seen to originate from the anterior lateral surface of the sacrum, which means they will be seen to originate from the anterior region of the sacrum. And the fibers are directed through the greater sciatic foramen. Remember, we already established that the greater sciatic notch is what is transformed into the greater sciatic foramen. This is where we have the greater sciatic notch here, also arrowed in yellow. This notch, we say that it is an indentation that is created on the helium. This notch is also further transformed into a foramen that is then seen to provide allowance for the passage of structures. So this greater sciatic notch is transformed into the greater sciatic foramen by the sacrospinous ligament. And this is what is highlighted here in purple. This is the sacrospinous ligament here that is seen to originate from the spine of the ischium and its runs seem to be finally inserted on the sacrum. So at this point, you see this sacrospinous ligament that is highlighted here in purple transforming the greater sciatic notch into the greater sciatic foramen. And this transformation, of course, is as a result of the pattern by which the sacrospinous ligament runs. This is where we then have the formation of the greater sciatic foramen. This greater sciatic foramen is what is seen to provide the passageway for the fibers of the piriformis. So you see the fibers of the piriformis muscle parting through the greater sciatic foramen, and this is how it exits the pelvic cavity. And upon its exit, the fibers of this muscle is seen at the posterior region of the pelvic cavity. And this is where it is seen to form part of the structural component of the deep layer of muscles that are located within the gluteal region. So upon its exit, of course, after passing through the greater sciatic foramen, you see the fibers then finally inserted on the greater truncator of the femur. And this is what is seen to be carried here in yellow. This is where we have the femur, and this is the greater truncator at the superior edge. So you see the fibers of the piriformis are finally inserted on the greater truncator of the femur. And this is one of the muscles that we see within the deep layer around the gluteal region. The second muscle that we would be highlighting is the obliterator internus. The obliterator internus muscle is what is seen to be arrowed here in green. This muscle is also one of the muscles that are located within the deep layer of the gluteal region. And you see the fibers of this muscle originating from the posterior surface of the obliterator foramen. This is where we have the obliterator foramen here, yeah, harrowed in grain. And you see the fibers of the obliterator internus muscle originating from the posterior surface of the obliterator foramen. And after this origination, these fibers are directed through the lesser sciatic foramen. This is where we have the lesser sciatic foramen here. We know that this lesser sciatic foramen is also formed by the sacrotuberous ligament. This is where we have the sacrotuberous ligament here, highlighted in yellow. This sacrotuberous ligament is also seen to transform the lesser sciatic notch into the lesser sciatic foramen. This is where we have the creation of the lesser sciatic foramen at this inferior end. This is where we have the sacrotuberous ligament here, highlighted in yellow. We know that the sacrotuberous ligament is seen to run from the tuberosity of the ischium here at this inferior end 
and inserted also on the sacrum. So you have this sacrotuberous ligament transforming the lesser sciatic notch into the lesser sciatic foramen. So this foramen is seen to create a passageway for the fibers of the obliterator internus muscle. This kind of presentation is also seen at the superior end where the greater sciatic foramen is seen to provide a passageway also for the fibers of the piriformis. So this kind of presentation is also seen at the upper region. So at this lower region, we have the lesser sciatic foramen creating a passageway for the fibers of the obliterator internal muscle. And it is through this end or means that it is able to exit the pelvic cavity. And upon its exit here, you see the fibers also are finally inserted on the greater trochetta of the femur. This is where we have the greater trunchetta of the femur, and this is where the fibers of the obliterator internal muscle are finally inserted upon. So this is the second muscle that would be highlighting as a structural component of the deep layer of the glottal region. The next muscle that we have in the deep compartment is the superior gemellus muscle. This is where we have the superior gemellus muscle here that is arrowed in brown. The superior gemellus muscle is so named because it is placed superior to the obliterator internal muscle. Remember, this is where we have the obliterator internal muscle here, I like it in red. And above this muscle, we have the superior gemellus muscle. And this is what is already at this point. So this name is so drafted because of the position that it has in relation to the obliterator internal muscle. This superior gemellus muscle is seen to originate from the spine of the ischium, this is where we have the spine of the ischium here that is arrowed here in brown. And the fibers are finally seen to travel laterally where they are finally inserted on the greater truncator of the femur. And this is what is seen to be also arrowed here in brown. So you see that this muscle runs from the spine of the ischium and is inserted on the greater truncator of the femur. It's the superiorly located to the obliterator internal muscle. What well, inferior to the obliterator internal muscle, we have the inferior gemellus muscle, and this is what is seen to be carried here in blue. This inferior gemellus muscle is also so named based on the relationship that it has with the obliterator internal muscle. Remember, we have the superior gemellus muscle that is harrowed here in brown, that is superiorly placed to the obliterator internal muscle. So we have the inferior gemellus muscle here, also inferiorly placed to the obliterator internal muscle. So these names are so drafted based on the relationships that they have with the obliterator internal muscle. But the inferior gemellus muscle is seen to originate from the ischia tuberosity that is already at this point. This is where we have the ischia tuberosity. And you see the fibers also laterally where they are finally inserted on the greater truncata of the femur. You can see that a number of these muscles are inserted on the greater truncata of the femur. And this is why these muscles exert actions on the lower limb. We've tried to highlight this at the beginning of this lecture. The next muscle that we would see is the quadratus femoris muscle. This is the quadratus femoris that is harrowed at this end. This is the most inferiorly placed muscle within the deep compartment of the gluteal muscle. And this muscle presents a four-sided configuration. These fibers of the quadratus femoris are seen to originate from the lateral wall of the ischia tuberosity. And this is what is harrowed at this medial end. And you see these fibers also are driven or directed laterally where they are finally inserted on the intertruncateric crest of the femur. This is where we have the intertruncateric crest of the femur. This is a crest that is created between the greater and the lesser truncata. Remember, this is where we have the greater truncata of the femur and inferior layer is where we have the lesser truncata. So you have a crest created in between the greater and the lesser truncata. And this is what is referred to as the intertruncateric crest. And this is where we have the final insertion point of the quadratus femoris muscle. So you see that we have in totality five muscles located within the deep compartment of the the gluteal region. These muscles are overlined by the superficial group of muscles, which we would be highlighting in our next slide. So for the superficial group of muscles, these muscles are four in number and of course are superficially placed within the gluteal region. These muscles are seen to be placed over the deep compartment 
of the gluteal region. We already highlighted the deep layer of muscles in our previous slide, and this is what we'll be overlying it. These muscles are responsible for abduction and also extension of the lower limb. So before we drive in into establishing these muscles, we are going to be creating alignment projected on the posterior surface of the bony pelvis. So let's try and use this side of the bony pelvis. First one that we would be looking at here is the inferior gluteal line. This is the inferior gluteal line here that is carried here in red. This inferior gluteal line is a prominence that is created at the inferior region. And superior to this region, we have the anterior gluteal line. This is the anterior gluteal line here that is harrowed here in blue. And we also have at the posterior end, we have the posterior gluteal line that is harrowed here in yellow. So you see that at the posterior region of the bony background of the gluteal region, we have some prominences that are created. And these are used to establish the origination point of some of the muscles that we would be highlighting. So let's try and use this other side to also establish where we have this gluteal line. This region that is highlighted here in dotted red is where we have the inferior gluteal line. And of course, at the upper head here, we have the anterior gluteal line here that is highlighted here in dotted blue. While at the more posterior end behind here, we have the posterior gluteal line that is highlighted here in dotted yellow. So driving through the origin of the superficial layer of muscles, we'd be using this orientation as a landmark of their point of origin. So the first muscle that I'll be looking at is the gluteus minimus. Gluteus minimus, from the name, it is the deepest and also the smallest. The gluteus minimus is seen to originate between the inferior and the anterior gluteal line. Remember, this is where we have the inferior gluteal line here, demarcated here in dotted red. And above this region, we have the anterior gluteal line that is demarcated in dotted blue. So in between these two sub-regions, it's where we have the fibers of this muscle originating from. And you see that they are directed laterally before they are finally inserted on the greater truncata of the femur. So this is how the gluteus minimus originates in respect to the gluteal lines. Then going to the second muscle of the superficial layer of muscles, we have this gluteus medius. This gluteus medius is located in between the gluteus minimus and the gluteus maximus that we would be talking about after this. So the gluteus medius is seen to originate between the anterior and the posterior gluteal lines. This is where we have the anterior gluteal line here, and we have the posterior gluteal line here at this superior head. So in between these two spaces, it's where we have the fibers of the gluteus medius originating from. And finally, you see that the fibers of this muscle are driven laterally, where they are finally inserted on the greater truncata of the femur. Then the next muscle is the gluteus maximus. This gluteus maximus is the most superficially placed. And you see that this muscle is seen to overlap on the gluteus medius and also the gluteus minimus. So it originates from extensive points. So you see some fibers of this muscle originating behind the posterior gluteal line. And this is what you have here at this point that is highlighted here in purple. So you have fibers of the gluteus maximus originating behind the posterior gluteal line. And some of its fibers are also seen to originate from the posterior lateral surface of the sacrum and also the posterior lateral surface of the Cossacks. You see that the gluteus maximus has an extensive point of origination. And these fibers are seen to be directed also laterally and downwards, where they are finally inserted on two points. The first point where they are inserted upon is the gluteal tuberosity of the femur. We have a tuberosity created around the head of the femur here where the fibers of the gluteus maximus are inserted upon. Then the next point of insertion is the iliotibial tract. So you see that the fibers of the gluteus maximus are inserted on two points after their origination from an extensive point as we have highlighted. And because of this, you see that the gluteus maximus muscle is seen to overlap on the gluteus medius and also the gluteus minimus considering the pattern by which the fibers originate and also run, and finally, of course, are inserted on two points as we have highlighted. The last muscle that is seen within the superficial layer of muscle is the tensor facial latter. This is the most laterally placed muscle, and this is what is seen to be highlighted here in black. This muscle is seen to originate from the iliac crest above here, 
some of its fibers are also seen to originate from the anterior superior iliac spine before they are finally directed downwards and inserted on the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial tract is a thick band that is located on the lateral region of the tract. So you see that these muscles are superficially placed indeed and are seen to overlie on the deep layer of muscles that we described in our previous slide. So these are the muscular components of the gluteal region. And we've tried to describe this muscular component into the two subunits for our easy understanding. So let's drive through to see the other structural components that are contained within the posterior gluteal region. So looking at the vessels, we also have a number of vessels located within the posterior gluteal region. And the first one is the inferior gluteal artery and also the inferior gluteal vein. We also have the superior gluteal artery and also the inferior vein. So if you try to use this image in describing how we have the emergence of the inferior and the superior gluteal arteries and also the veins, this is where we have the abdominal hiatus here, arrowed in black. The abdominal aorta is seen to finally terminate and divide into the right and the left common iliac arteries. And this is what is harrowed here at this point. The common iliac arteries are also seen to divide into the internal iliac artery and also the external iliac artery. The internal iliac artery is seen within the pelvic cavity, while the external iliac artery is directed towards the lower limb where to be supplying this region. So for the internal iliac artery, this internal iliac artery, of course, located within the pelvic cavity, is also further divided into the anterior trunk and also the posterior trunk. The anterior trunk is what gives the emergence of the inferior gluteal artery. And this is what is highlighted here in dotted blue. This inferior gluteal artery is one of the terminal branches of the anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery. And after the emergence of this artery, it is seen to be directed through the greater sciatic foramen. Specifically, it is directed through the infrapiriform foramen where it exits the pelvic cavity. And at this space, it finds itself within the gluteal region. We also have the superior gluteal artery that is an emergence from the posterior trunk of the internal iliac artery. This superior gluteal artery is seen also to be directed through the greater sciatic foramen. But specifically, it is directed through the suprapiriform foramen. So you see that these two vessels have a specific part that they run within the greater sciatic foramen. So using also this image, this is where we have the piriformis here, highlighted in yellow. We try to use this proper alignment to further explain or illustrate how the piriformis divides the greater sciatic foramen into two subforamina. Let's say this is where we have the greater sciatic foramen here, highlighted here at this superior end. And we have the piriformis muscle that is highlighted here in yellow, parting through the greater sciatic foramen. Because the piriform is passed through this foramen, it is now seen to further subdivide it into two subforamina. So below the piriform is we have the infrapiriform foramen, while above it, we have the suprapiriform foramen. So the infrapiriform foramen is what gives the passageway for the inferior gluteal artery. Why the suprapiriform foramen gives the passageway for the superior gluteal artery. You can see that these two arteries have specific parts by which they run within the greater sciatic foramen, which of course is subdivided into two subforamina by the piriformis muscle. And it's good for us to be able to explain and also justify this. So this is where we have the part of the inferior gluteal artery that is highlighted here in dotted blue. Then we also have the superior gluteal artery here that is highlighted here at the superior edge. So this is how they pack through specific subregions of the greater sciatic foramen. If you try to use this lower image here, this is the posterior view of the pelvic cavity. And this structure that is highlighted here in black is the sacrospinous ligament. We know that the sacrospinous ligament is what transforms the greater sciatic notch into the greater sciatic foramen. So you have the greater sciatic foramen at this edge that is highlighted here in yellow. And this structure that is harrowed here at this point is the piriformis. And this is where you see the piriformis further subdividing this greater sciatic foramen into two subforamina. So below the piriformis that is harrowed here in red is where we have the infrapiriform foramen. 
Why above that is arrow there in purple is where we have the supra piriform foramen. So you can see that this piriform ismos is what the subdivides the greater sciatic foramen into two subforamina. And because of this creation, we now have two foramina within the greater sciatic foramen, of course, by the piriformis. So superiorly here, we have the passageway for the superior gluteal artery, which is an emergence from the posterior trunk of the internal iliac artery. Then inferiorly, we have the passageway for the inferior gluteal artery, which is one of the terminal branches from the anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery. So this is how this is established. So this is where we have the inferior gluteal artery here, highlighted in dotted blue, and we have the superior gluteal artery here that is highlighted here. So this is how they pass through their specific roots within the greater sciatic foramen. Another vessel that we have within the posterior gluteal region is the internal pudenda artery, and also the internal pudenda vein. The internal pudenda artery is also seen within the space even though it is not supplying structures within the posterior gluteal region, but the posterior gluteal region is seen to create like a passageway for this vessel. The internal pudenda artery is seen to provide supply for the perineum. So if you try to use this image to illustrate how the internal pudenda artery emerges, this is where we have the anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery. So we have the internal pudenda artery as the second terminal branch of the anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery. So as it emerges, you see it's also passing through the greater sciatic foramen. But specifically, it's seen to pass through the infrapiriform foramen. Of course, it runs along inferiorly to the piriformis, imparting through the greater sciatic foramen. And this is how it exits the pelvic cavity. And when it exits the pelvic cavity, it also runs a short course around the space before it exits this region it's to be directed to its target point, which of course is the perineum. So you see the internal pudenda artery and also vein within this region. Even though there are no supply structures around the gluteal region, but the gluteal region is seen to provide like an access path for it to be directed to the perineum. Then going through the nerves that we have around the posterior gluteal region, we have the superior gluteal nerve and this is what is highlighted here at this point. The superior gluteal nerve is a branch from the sacral plexus. And we already established in our previous slide that we have the superior gluteal artery patterned above the piriformis, specifically through the supra-piriform foramen. So also the superior gluteal nerve that emerges from the sacral plexus. The sacral plexus is a collection of nerve network located within the pelvic cavity. So you have the emergence of the superior gluteal nerve within the pelvic cavity. And you see this nerve after its emergence, it is directed through the supra-piriform foramen for it to exit the pelvic cavity. So we also have the inferior gluteal nerve. The inferior gluteal nerve is also a branch from the sacral plexus, and it is seen specifically to be directed through the infrapiriform foramen. And this is what is highlighted here in blue. But now we should know how the supra and the infrapiriform foramen are, are created by the piriformis muscle. The next nerve that we have is the pudenda nerve. The pudenda nerve also emerges from the sacral plexus. And this is what is highlighted here in purple. The pudenda nerve, after it emerges, is also directed through the infrapiriform foramen. And you see it running this course, assessing the gluteal region. The pudenda nerve is not seen to provide innovations for structures within the gluteal region. It is seen to innovate the perineum. But the gluteal region creates like a passageway for this nerve for it to finally assess its target region, which is the perineum. So you have the pudenda nerve also within the posterior gluteal region, even though it is not supplying structures around that space. Then the next nerve that we have is the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is the largest branch that emerges from the sacral plexus. And this is what is highlighted here in black. This nerve is seen to provide innovations for the lower limb. It's also seen to pass through the gluteal region, even though it is not supplying structures around that space. So you see it being directed downwards where it will be providing innovations for structures around the lower limb. Of course, it's also an emergence from the sacral plexus. Then the last nerve that we have is the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh. This is what is highlighted here in green. This nerve is also an emergence from the sacral plexus. 
So let's look at the applied anatomy. The gluteal region is one of the regions in the body where intramuscular injections can be taken. The upper outer quadrant is the region where this injection is taken. And this is to prevent the damage of nerve. If you try to divide the gluteal region into four quadrants as shown in this image by the side, this region that is here in black is the point where this injection is directed. Why? This is to prevent the damage to nerve. Thanks for watching this video. Let's continue to stay glued to this channel.